You're not my dad! What up, Hope Biscuits? It's your girl Skitten, back at it again. Uh, first and foremost, welcome to day... Six? Five? I think it's six. Six of me showing you guys my earrings. Here you go, I don't have my beautiful nails to help along with. Here they are, here they are. Um, I got these ones, I think they're Mother of Pearl or Abalone, one of the two. Um, and I got them from this little shop in Seaport Village in San Diego, which I don't know. Okay, I haven't been to San Diego in years and I'm not gonna look it up in the middle of this video, but is Seaport Village still there? Cause last time I was there, there was a whole petition to keep Seaport Village and establish it as a historical site because they were trying to get rid of it to build some fucking condos or some shit. I don't fucking know. Uh, so I really hope it's still there cause Seaport Village is literally one of my favorite places to go. San Diego is one of my favorite places to go. Like it is literally heaven on earth, but Seaport Village, like my husband is so tired of Seaport Village. I'm, how many times can I say Seaport Village in one video? Let's find out, let's see. Uh, but my husband is so tired of that place. We've been there so many times. We go into the same shops every time, never go into a new shop. Um, first we go to Hot Licks, then we go to the Seashell Place, then we go to the place that sells all the glass, then we go to Ben and Jerry's. Might stop somewhere to get something to eat, but honestly, I don't think I've ever actually eaten anywhere in there. Uh, then we go to the little telescope thing. It's it's always a good time. I love that place. Auntie who's in, I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are staying safe and sanitized. I don't know why I did that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that again. That made me dizzy actually. Uh, I've been on a diet. I've been on a, not a no carb, but a low carb diet. And boy, let me tell you, let me tell you how good carbs sound when you are not eating carbs. I don't even eat. There's things that like I don't even really eat and I'm just like craving them now because I haven't been eating carbs and it's, it's making things difficult because I'm like, oh yeah, I mean, I haven't had that in a while. I could definitely eat, like, what's something I, like chocolate cake. I don't like, I think brownies, right? Okay, I don't like brownies. I do not like chocolate cake. I do not like, chocolate cake is the worst flavor of cake. Cho brownies are the worst type of pastry. They're, they're just, there's so many better things out there. And I've just been like, man, I could go for a fucking like, triple fudge dark chocolate brownie right now. And I'm just like, and I know, I already know, I would get two bites in, I, I two, but this is four technically, but two, I'd get two bites in and just be tired of it. But it just sounds so good. Like I'm literally salivating thinking about it. And I just, no pain, no gain, no pain, no gain. Anyways, uh, we are here to watch some more overly sarcastic productions. I've been on a real history kick, so feel free to recommend history videos down below because I'm loving it. History, mythology, all of that, getting back into it. Um, I'm ready, I'm down, I'm happy, I'm psyched. Uh, but this one is rulers who are actually good, some history hijinks. So I've been really focusing on Red because, you know, hey Red, how's it going? Hi. Uh, but uh, we've got some blue mixed in here. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. History can be hard, right? Lots of timelines and players to keep track of and discussions of the interplay between political, economic, cultural, and military factors can easily become mystifying to the point of incoherence. Imagine the surprise of European farmers who learn that a disruption to tourism in the Holy Land means they have to pay higher taxes to fund a transcontinental war. It's right. a little tricky sometimes. This is why historians aiming to both lighten the vibe and slim down the amount of narrative knives to juggle may gravitate towards singular narratives about famous figures, rulers, generals, and other such go-getters. This is often known as great man history, but it is stupid and I hate it because not only is it insultingly reductive and so slavishly wrote that it still somehow manages to be boring. Y'all, I cannot describe the depth of feelings that I have about King Henry VIII. I like, I have so many feelings. I, I, I can argue about that man and I mean the Tudor dynasty in general, but King Ed, there is a special place in hell. There was, a, cause he's already, he's been dead, but there is a special place in hell reserved for that man. I, I guarantee you, I, I, I fucking guarantee you. 
but it tends to blindly glorify characters that, more often than not, are assholes. So let's <laughs> try something else. We'll ditch the arbitrary concept of greatness and give praise where it's actually due by discussing two kind of the good worst, rulers yes. in Agreed, history, yes. King Cyrus of Persia and Sultan Saladin of Egypt. Two noble, genuinely virtuous people who, in a statistical anomaly, are not profoundly awful after three minutes of cursory research. Oh, of course, okay. this is not to say that they are blameless. They're monarchs who conquered stuff. Their literal job description involves killing thousands of people to acquire land, and the simple Ye act of ruling necessitates countless choices, big and small, that negatively affect someone or other. My point here is to look at how someone in an innately perilous moral position can nonetheless demonstrate a commitment to virtue. So, okay. to have a little fun with pure biography in such a way that won't make me furious, Let's do some history. Now let's, let's do rewind it. to the 500s BC and meet our first protagonist in Persia. Well, politically, this whole stretch was under the Median Empire, just east of the Neo-Babylonian Empire in Mesopotamia. According to legend, the Median king Astyages was feeling antsy about a dream that prophesied his overthrow at the small, adorably stubby hands of his as-of-yet unborn grandson. But despite orders for his daughter to kill the child, the itty-bitty Cyrus survived in secret always. for ten years before being discovered by Astyages. Although Why do they always resort to killing the babies? Like, I don't understand. I mean... You don't have to kill the baby. Just like chop off her hand or something. Back then that was basically like, you know, not fit to rule because God chose to take your hand or something or other. Pretty set on his course a decade earlier, this time he was content to let Cyrus just kind of go home to Persia and exist. In okay. 559, right. Cyrus inherited kingship of Persia from his father, but they were still subordinate to Media. So in 553, he revolted against his grandfather Astyages and improbably won, conquering Media in 550 and creating the Achaemenid Persian Empire, well, named congrats, after a distant Cyrus. ancestor. From there, Cyrus zoomed, Speed. swooping west into Anatolia to conquer the kingdom of Lydia pushing east toward the Hindu Kush mountains, and then finally into Mesopotamia to topple the Empire of Babylon in 539. Fourteen okay. years after telling his grandfather to scram, Cyrus had an objectively insane amount of territory, That's with somewhere dope. on the order of 50 million people spread over dozens of cultures. Cyrus was managing Greeks, Phoenicians, Semites, Mesopotamians, Medians, Persians, Bactrians, Parthians, and Indians. And those are Jesus. all pretty wide descriptors, listing off all the ethnicities and subcultures of the Achaemenid Persian Empire would leave me here all day. So you might expect someone in Cyrus's position to tell all those people, gross, too complicated. No, no rights for you. Act more Persian, speak my language, and also pay more taxes. Because right, that's yeah. precisely what the Babylonian Empire had done. The capital city was rich beyond belief because it was drenched in tax revenue and loaded with treasures from all over the empire. Like statues of local gods, which, according to many of these cultures, were the actual gods themselves. And oh, Cyrus God. was aware that this was not the nicest way to treat one's subjects. When the Persian armies marched on Babylon, Cyrus claimed that the great god Bel had deserted Babylon because of their greed and cruelty, switching his divine favor onto the Persians. Now, let's oh, just take okay. a second to appreciate that Cyrus fundamentally works on the same moral framework as China's Mandate of Heaven. It's obviously not the same thing, but it's clearly a similar thought process, and it definitely informs our reading of his benevolence. Right. So now that Cyrus was in charge of, well, functionally everything, everything yeah. he made some changes, like sending divine statues back to what he called the places that made them happy, which is just so adorably sweet. He That's also really allowed cute, people yeah. to go back to their happy places, which is corroborated by a little source known as the Bible. Because after Israel was conquered by Babylon, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and most Jews were deported to Mesopotamia. Right. Cyrus undid all that, allowing Jews to return home and even sponsoring the construction of a new temple to replace the first one. Many Jews were content to stay in big city Babylon, but the migration back to the Levant had a huge cultural and theological impact on Judaism as a whole. The books right. of Isaiah and Ezra describe how nice it is to be treated like people, despite their difference in religion and ethnicity, but if we had more sources from around the empire, I'm sure we'd have lots of stories like this, as official records indicate multiple repatriation and reconstruction programs. That's but all this cool. pan-imperial benevolence wasn't just for warm, fuzzy feelings, because Obviously. Cyrus was extremely pragmatic. He yeah. recognized where Media and Babylon failed, and knew that the disparate parts of the empire would be happy if they could practice their customs in peace, and 
reminded exactly. the economic infrastructure of the empire brought wealth into the provinces rather than just yanking it out as taxes. So exactly. Cyrus and his yeah. successors worked to connect the empire and facilitate trade by building roads, issuing coins, and standardizing weights and measures. After completing his conquests, Cyrus led with kindness and backed it up with actions that would directly ensure the long-term stability and well-being of the Persian state. Man. Which is how you maintain power, right? You make sure that your populace is content. Like, yeah. It is amazing what happens when you actually try. Our next <laughs> subject won't move us very far, but we will time skip about 1600 years ahead, which Jesus. lands us in the Holy Lands during the Crusades. So oh I'm already not having fun. Politically, this corner of the world was... Hmm crowded, with crusader states hugging the Levantine coast, and a smattering of small Muslim vassal states sandwiched between the Egyptian Fatimid Caliphate and the Seljuk Sultanate. Our protagonist, yeah. Salah ad-Din, was born Yusuf ibn Ayyub in northern Mesopotamia, where he was educated in language, theology, Islamic political and military history, and science. But medieval Muslim scholarship was almost always fantastic, so this really yeah. shouldn't be surprising. There was, however, no substitute for experience, and as- It's, like, so wild, like- it's so wild, too, because uh, Europeans especially um, didn't trust the knowledge that, like, the Muslims had. But they, are, they had accumulated so much knowledge. It, it, was, it was absolutely just mind-boggling how much knowledge they possessed and that was just ignored and denied for the longest time by Europe to Egypt, where some clever politics, a victory in battle, and maybe assassinating the Fatimid vizier resulted in Saladin becoming vizier of Egypt. Oh, and okay. thanks to the fortuitous death of a couple caliphs, Saladin ruled his new Ayyubid Sultanate by 1174. And boy, oh, he Jesus. could have done a heck of a lot worse than Egypt. Throughout history, the place has been well supplied, interconnected, and extremely rich. So it yeah. made a wonderful base of operations from which to go pester the Crusaders. While he was swooping around the Levant and up to Syria, Saladin's main focus stayed on on the Christian kingdoms along the coast. He obviously Smart. had a religious motivation in taking Jerusalem, but this typically theological rivalry had one especially irritating antagonist by the name of Reynald of Châtillon. From the Sultan's perspective, Reynald's singular goal in life was to give Saladin a heart attack from raw stress by breaking every treaty he possibly could and killing <laughs> innocent pilgrims basically for funsies. Oh my Reynald God. unambiguously sucked, and even Christian sources at the time openly wished for Saladin to get him. In 11 83, he did get close when he besieged Reynald's castle at Carrack. But Saladin heard Reynald's stepson and Princess Isabella of Jerusalem had been married in the castle earlier that day and God was spending damn it. the evening in one of the towers. So he ordered his army to continue the siege, but be mindful so as not to disturb the tower. The God castle was too it. well defended, so Saladin withdrew a few days later, but this still shows Saladin's chivalry and his good sense of humor. Just because he was at war didn't mean he was going to be a jerk about it. But Saladin wouldn't have to wait long to get that Weasley Reynold, or Jerusalem for that matter. In okay. 1187, Saladin besieged the city of Tiberias and baited a crusader army to ride out from Acre in the middle of the summer across a very long road with only one water spring. When Why? Saladin subsequently ambushed the army at the horns of Hattin, it was already game over. Most of the army was killed or captured, including the king of Jerusalem and Monsieur Reynald. The king was cool, so Saladin treated him with the utmost courtesy, but Reynald was beyond negotiation, so yes. Saladin scolded him for his awful behavior before grabbing a sword and killing him himself. After that, the king was well. ransomed and sent peacefully home. Although, home is a stretch, because Saladin took advantage of the crusaders' sudden lack of an army to conquer Jerusalem and <laughs> almost all of the Holy he said, Land. You can go and in home, contrast but also your to the Crusaders' massacre of 1099, Saladin took Jerusalem with far less violence and vandalism, ransoming okay. most Christians in the city and letting several thousand just go free. This, of course, prompted a third crusade, pitting Saladin against England's King Richard the Lionheart, but this contest was far more chivalrous. Although yeah. Richard executed thousands of Muslim captives in Acre, he was still infinitely better than Reynald. When Richard lost a horse and fell ill at the Battle of Ar Suf, Saladin, who lost that battle, gifted two horses from his royal stables and sent his royal physician to treat the English king. The war soon okay. ended in a treaty that restricted crusader kingdoms to the coast and recognized the ca Also, question, did Richard allow, did Richard allow his, that physician to treat him? Because that was like a big deal. That was a sin, basically. So, 
to let like a non-Christian physician treat you? Hmm. Saladin offered to allow Christian pilgrims to still visit the city. So it's not hard okay. to see why Thanks. even sources from his adversaries had a deep respect for the man. Both within and beyond their respective empires, Cyrus and Saladin are well deserving of their reputations. Their political and military accomplishments were plenty already, but it takes a really special figure for even their enemies to praise their underlying character. Generals Agreed. who fought against Saladin wrote him letters of apology, and then even the Greek writer Xenophon cited Cyrus <laughs> as the ideal king. To a degree, both of these okay. figures got caught on the other side of an arbitrary East versus West conflict, which is why us Westerners don't know them as well as we arguably should, but despite the unkind bias of various Greek and Crusader historians against right. Persians and yeah. Muslims respectively, the reputations of these two have clearly transcended cultural boundaries as models of what it means to use power for good. As Mostly for good. About as good as a monarch can use their power right. for, all things considered. And heck, maybe recent history is just getting to me, but I, uh... I don't know, I feel like we can maybe learn a little bit from that. That was super enjoyable. Um, I do think it's a pity that like you don't learn about monarchs of like the, you know, Eastern Europe and Asia and stuff like that. Unt like, you know, Persian, whatever. You don't learn about that unless you choose to specialize in that later like in college you might get like a brief smattering here and there in high school but man i just i know that there's not like enough time in the year to just go over world history but honestly i just feel like america would be such a better place if they could just learn about places other than the u.s i have feelings guys i have feelings Auntie who's in. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to leave your reaction requests and recommendations down in the comments below. And other than that, peace out, Hope Biscuits. It's skin lit. <laughs>